Welcome to Abnormal Truth, everyone. Thanks for clicking in as usual. Today, I have a guest. His name is Vic Cundiff. He's the creator of Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio and Dogman Encounters Radio. And uh, what he has accomplished here is he has been able to gain the trust and gain a following to where he can get eyewitnesses on um, on his radio show. And it's really a really thrilling show. And you get to learn a lot about this phenomena because um, they always stay on, on point and it's just him and the witness. And um, he is giving the witnesses an outlet to tell their story without being ridiculed. And also, he is offering a great service just as far as entertainment and knowledge of uh, what you may see in the woods sometimes. So, hi, Vic. You there? I sure am, Jason. How are you? Oh, very doing great. I really appreciate you for coming on Abnormal Truth. And um, so, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your radio shows? I'd love to. Before I do, I just want to thank you again for having me on, and it's an honor to be your first guest on your show. I wish you nothing but the best of luck with it. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said, I was uh, really thrilled when you got back with me so quick. Oh, more than happy to do it. As far as Dogman Encounters Radio goes... Dogman Encounters is a show about people who unfortunately see dogmen. It's so easy to make the mistake and think that the show's about dogmen, but that's not accurate. That's not how it is. You mentioned earlier when you opened up the show about how there's an entertainment factor that comes along with the show. Well, that's not intended. That's just a side effect of the fact that you're interviewing people about something that's so unnerving. You know how it is in society. People turn towards the car crash so, so that they can see it instead of turning away from it. And I think that's the same reason why so many people have been drawn to the show. And they look at dog mean encounters as entertainment. It's so easy to forget the fact that while you're listening to the show, these are stories to you. These are experiences to the eyewitnesses who come on the show and talk about what they saw, what they've been through. So I always hope that people listening to the show, I hope they don't lose sight of that fact because that's a very important one. Yeah, I, I don't think they do. And when I mentioned it as entertainment, that is really the least of it. But it still has value there. And while entertaining people, um, you can really pick up some uh, some some good hints and clues on what you may need to do if you see one of these um so you may even be helping protect people from doing something you know not that smart if they encounter one of these so um i guess my first question would be is uh you know how did you get interested into bigfoot and dogman have did you have an, an encounter did somebody did you you know have an encounter well, back in 2006, I started listening to all these Bigfoot-specific talk radio shows. I would tune in regularly on Monday nights for this Bigfoot show, and then on Tuesdays, I knew that this show would come on every week, and then on Thursday, there was another one. Well, by doing that and consequently hanging out in the chat rooms, all those shows tended to have... I started rubbing elbows with other people who had the same kind of fascination with the subject. Well, about a year later, one of those people who was a host for one of those shows, he dropped out of that show for whatever reason. And when he did, he put the word in letting the host of that show who was left know that he thought I would be a good stand in for him to take his place. I wasn't all that sure about the idea of doing that at first, but as I thought about it, I thought, you know what, maybe I ought to give this a try. It sounds like fun. So I spoke with the host. His name is or was Shane McMahon. He's now since deceased, unfortunately. He was the host of Campfire Shadows. We hosted the show in 2007 and a little bit of 2008 before I left the show. But while I was doing that show with Shane, 
some of the people who would go out and beat the bushes all the time looking for Sasquatch, they started coming back talking about these things they would run into that they referred to as being dog-faced boogers. Down in the South, booger is an appellation that's commonly used to describe Bigfoot. When I'm sitting there listening to these people talk about these dog-faced boogers, I'm thinking, what? What's that? As I found out more about them, I found out that they're actually dogmen, but back then I didn't know about the term. Well, as I started to learn more and more about these dogmen, all of a sudden what had attracted me so strongly to the Sasquatch phenomenon, that just got pushed into the background because what had attracted me to the Sasquatch phenomenon in the first place, how, how spooky the whole topic is, how cryptic they are, how unnerving it would be to sit there and listen to people talk about their encounters with them. It was multiplied by a factor of 10 with dog men. So that became my new true passion. As I started to learn more and more about the dog man topic, it became evident pretty quickly that these poor eyewitnesses who were running into them, they didn't have any representation. They didn't have any convenient place to go to talk about their encounters and and get help and feel better. So I thought, you know what, there's a real niche here that maybe I could fill. So years later, I, I created the website dogmanencounters.com where you can still go and read about other people's encounters that they've had with dogmen from all over the, the world for that matter. And then not too long after that, on August 22nd of 2014, I created the show Dogman Encounters Radio thinking, you know what, by not just talking with these people in private about their experiences, if I actually had a show where they could come on the show and unload, they could come on and publicly share their experiences with an audience and grow from that, I might really have something here, something of good use. So I created the show and the rest is history. I started it back then. It's been over two years now and the sky's the limit. Well, I know it's kind of hard to pinpoint how many cases you've probably came by, but if you had to guess, how many cases do you think you've gone through? And this doesn't necessarily have to be interviews, but just, you know, how many cases do you think you've come across? How many cases in total? Yeah, and like I said, it, it, mm. it's hard to know. But if you had to guess. Oh, I don't know. It would be in the hundreds. Yeah. I, I really don't know. Yeah, I would say whew, it would be somewhere in the hundreds. Yeah, I don't definitely. Know. I, isn't your YouTube channel, it's it's over 100 videos now, isn't it? Yeah, we're. I think we are on episode 125, I believe. Now, um, one of one of the neat things is that you obviously have this trust because you're able to interview so many of these witnesses. How hard was it to get to that point where you had witnesses contacting you and wanting to be on your show? Did that take a while to develop, or since you were already on a previous radio show, people kind of already knew you? Well, dogmanencounters.com was the linchpin that made all this possible with the show. By having that in place, I had spoken with more than enough people to have a, a stock to, to pick from, to actually bring eyewitnesses onto the show. Without that, I don't think there would have been any way I could have done this. But that's basically how I was able to, to have a steady supply of eyewitnesses to bring on. I understand, though, that for every 10 people who come forward and share their experiences with you, maybe one of those, maybe two, are willing to actually come on the show. So the show is just the tip of the iceberg. It's no indication whatsoever for all the people who actually have contacted me with their experiences. And of course, if somebody wanted to be on your show anonymously, uh, you would let them do that, right? It's kind of up to them whether they reveal their name or not. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, I do that all the time. Sometimes we'll switch their name to a different first name. Other people are fine with using their first names only. But sure, yeah, I have people on there that want to remain anonymous all the time. And 
of course, that's never a problem. The show is here to help. It's not here to hurt. Oh, definitely. And you are helping people. And I would like everyone to know that doesn't know already, on your website, www.dogmanencountersradio.com, I will put uh, all of his links in the description below, but you can actually submit your encounters to Vic and actually uh, ask to be on the show if you want. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, the process is you go on to the website and fill out a form that basically allows you to explain the details of your encounter. And then after you do that, then I basically contact you and, and talk with you about your experience. And then after I have a feel for what happened to you or whatnot, if you check the box that you are interested in being a guest on the show, then I, I bring you on. Understand, though, if you want to be a guest on the show or if you flat out just want to talk to me, it's not dogmanencountersradio.com you would go to. You would need to go to dogmanencounters.com. Go to that website dogmanencounters.com and on the home page at the bottom that's where the encounter report form is that you would fill out okay very good very good um how many reports would you say you get a month you get like a a lot well it really varies some months they just pour in other months it gets pretty slow so you never really know what to expect it just depends i've had times where i've gotten over 12 encounters in a week so it just depends is there any state in the u.s that seems to be inundated with the dogmen more than any other state well, I don't know of any state that's clearly having more encounters being reported out of it than any other, but I can tell you right now, Kentucky definitely seems to be a hot spot. Kentucky and Pennsylvania seem to have a lot of action going on, but Tennessee does too, and of course Michigan, it seems to always have a lot of activity. It's Like I said, it's really hard to pinpoint the most active state, but all those states I just mentioned, they do seem to be really active with activity. And I would just like to mention that uh, this happens across the world, correct? I mean, not just in the United States, but this is a pretty much a worldwide phenomena. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you go to Dogman Encounters Radio, I'm sorry, if you go to dogmanencounters.com and look at the top and click on the Encounters slash Sightings page, if you look down... And the midsection of the page, you'll see an option to click on an icon that says Worldwide. If you click on that, you'll see right now that there's an encounter from Norway, there's an encounter from Brazil, there's an encounter up from New Zealand, one from Austria, one from Australia. So there have been others from other places around the world abroad that I haven't posted, but yeah, they, they do come in from all over. Now... Yeah, I, I actually, I didn't know that. I didn't see that on that. So I'm definitely going to check that part of your site out because I didn't see that. And so it's basically mapped out a little bit, or is it just, uh, do you have the encounters, uh, you know, the witnesses writing out the encounters so I can go read uh, people's encounters? Well, if you click on the encounter slash sightings link at the top of the page, what opens up is a page where all the states are listed out in alphabetical order. And the states where I have reports fielded from, they're in red. States that are in white, there are states where I don't have any encounters posted yet. But what you do is you would just click on one of the red states of interest to you. And then when you do that, a page opens up to list all the encounters from that state. So then you can go ahead and click on the county that interests you and that encounter will open up. And then that's right. Yeah, you can read the eyewitnesses encounter, the details of their encounter that they shared. Really neat, really neat. Um, it seems to be that there may be a few different types of dogmen. Um, from what I've heard so far, some of them seem, most of them seem to have hair. Uh, and there is, there was a few uh, witnesses that were saying that it looked like it had no hair or very little hair at all. 
Do you think there's different subspecies of these dogmen? Well, I do think there probably is some sort of an order to them like that, where you've got certain sub subspecies. They have a lot of different looks to think that they all look the same. That's not true. Whether it's a matter of them having subspecies and that's why they look different, I really don't know. But there are several different looks the dogmen have. I think I've counted 11 or 12 different variances into how dogmen can actually look. Now, I know in the uh, abduction, alien abduction field, researchers sometimes hold back certain uh, characteristics that they know that are, that are reported over and over so they can kind of vet uh, people that are uh, you know, telling their stories. Do you find yourself having to do that or... Do you have to weed through a lot of bogus reports? And I imagine you have a really good idea of what the parameters are of basically, you know, what kind of configuration the dogmen can kind of manifest in, you know? Oh, sure. I do hold back info for that very reason so that I can vet people. There are a lot of circumstances where people aren't close enough to the dog man to be able to see these features. So consequently, there's no way to truly vet them other than to go by your gut instinct. A promise I made to myself when I started the show was to not be so hypersensitive about being fooled, about being tricked by someone lying to me that I wound up throwing out an eyewitness's encounter who actually possibly had seen the dogmen they were telling me about because I was so worried about not being fooled. Uh, I really hate the idea of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. To me, it would be horrible to have someone who actually did have an encounter approach me for help just to be turned away because for whatever reason, I mistakenly think that they're lying to me. So I try to be lenient on that and give people the benefit of the doubt but yeah there definitely are cases where it becomes clear to me that they're just trying to pull a fast one and i just send them on their way yeah and i, I would like to say vic that I, I haven't listened to all of the videos you have yet but i have yet to run across one that i thought was lying every single uh video i've listened to so far the witnesses just ring true to me and that's what's so great about you actually getting witnesses to tell their story because uh it just it's it's a, a much more of a bigger dynamic than just reading an encounter although reading encounters to me is very interesting but when you can actually hear the eyewitnesses recount their experiences and this is so scary right uh i believe dogman to be the most scariest cryptid i could think of that is i wouldn't say widely seen but you know when you have bigfoot that has been sighted were what centuries i don't know how long bigfoot goes back but it's it's across the world you have people of all types and shapes and colors and sizes and walks of life um seeing these things i really think that you know it's uh it's you know i i don't know what to say about it but you know what do you think um, what do you think about werewolves? Now, this definitely comes up a lot because the, the feeling I'm getting is is that uh, most people are not considering these as werewolves. Uh, uh, you know, we're not probably talking lycanthropy here, but maybe the old myths came from these beings because they do have like a humanoid uh shape to them you know their arms are long so, so how do you that's that's a pretty i think one of the obvious questions is the 
werewolf, uh, you know, connection to these. What what's your take on that? Well, my take on it is, I think dogmen are what they are. They look that way 24/7, 365. I think it's a particular creature. I don't think it's a human that somehow magically transforms into a beast. But having said that. I really don't know. I'd have to see it to believe it, that it is just a case of them being werewolves. I'd have to see that to believe it, like I said. I don't believe that's the case. But having said that, I guess anything is possible if you look at the fact that we just now recently discovered some subatomic particles called quarks that can wink in and out of existence. What else have we ever seen that has the ability to do that? So... Like I said, I guess anything's possible, but I'd have to see that to believe that these were werewolves and not dogmen. And we don't really have any uh, accounts of anybody witnessing a, sh- uh, a shapeshifter in conjunction with these encounters, right? I mean, there's just almost no mention of it that I've heard so far. So um, I, I'm under that in. I'm under that school too. That this this sounds like a uh, just a predator. No, there have been eyewitnesses who have contacted me and told me about situations they've been in where they actually did witness people transform into a werewolf or something that resembles a werewolf. I that's not my specialty. So I passed those people along to people who would know a lot more about that type of a thing than I would, since werewolves are definitely not what I'm into, and I really don't know all that much about them. So whether they were telling the truth or not, I really don't know. But I will tell you that there have been people who have contacted me to share stories like that. So who knows? Has has there been a report of a dog man actually hurting a human i know they have hurt um they'll hurt animals and i've heard several reports of horses and dogs being uh, either maimed or killed but has one actually scratched or you know physically hurt a human well to answer that question if you listen to episode 52 titled the scars to prove it there is a gentleman who contacted me after telling me about being scratched by one wow he the man was coming up over a mountain in the tetons and well instead of giving the details of that show away i guess i'll just direct it towards episode 52 and highly recommend you listen right. to it and, and listen to what this poor man went through but yeah the answer to your question is yes i have been contacted by more than one person who actually was hin- injured hurt by a dog man what type of firearm would it t- do you, i mean i know this would be like a guess but what kind of firearm would take down one of these? What do you think you would have to have? Have you have you had a few stories of where they told you exactly what kind of weapon they were using and what kind of effect? Or does it affect the dogmen at all? Well, there have been cases that have come in where people talked about shooting a dogman, even with a fairly low caliber, small caliber weapon. And it was enough to drive the dogman away. But understand, there have been plenty of credible stories that have come in where people have used very powerful weaponry, not just pistols, but long guns, to pretty much no effect. So we really don't know what it would take to stop one. Yeah, I don't, I'm pretty sure you feel the same way, but I would not feel confident. Um, I, I don't even think it would be a good idea to shoot one unless it was just definitely coming for you, right? And that's like the only recourse you had because I don't think I would have a lot of faith that it would uh, bring one of these down, do you? Oh, sure. I always tell people if you have a gun and one is in the area, definitely I highly recommend not shooting a dog man unless you're convinced that it's going to attack you anyway. Right. Unless you're absolutely sure without a doubt that you're going to die, I always say, please do not try shooting one. While we're on that subject, uh, is there any kind of simple things that people should do if they happen to encounter a dog man in the woods or anywhere else? Say, like, uh, there's certain things you do with 
wild dogs there's certain things you should do and and should not do when you run into bears uh what kind of things have you learned about uh you know maybe getting away with your life if you see one of these well the first thing to remember is the point that you don't get away from a dog man i've had people tell me about being in the presence of one i mean almost within reaching distance and you're going to tell me that you ran 400 yards to your truck and got away from the dog man no you didn't get away from the dog man it let you get away because it didn't have it on its mind to take you out or to even scratch you but the advice i give people if you do find yourself in the presence of one just treat it like you would an encounter with a grizzly bear turn sideways don't give it your back because dog men seem to prefer to attack from behind turn sideways definitely do your best to never look it in the face if you don't look at its face you'll never know what its eyes look like looking at a dog man's eyes that like i've said on a lot of shows that's what's going to be most likely to cause the problems with nightmares where you sit up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat you can't sleep because you keep seeing those eyes over and over again because they're so terrifying to look at but back to the advice yeah turn sideways treat it just like you would treat a grizzly bear encounter don't do anything that it might take to be a challenge to its authority or dominance don't make eye contact no sudden movements and hopefully it'll leave you alone that's about the best you can do don't run though that's a, another thing i was about to ask you now i think i would uh kind of start backing up i mean not running like you said but would it be a good idea to just turn around and have a brisk walk in the opposite direction would that be a good idea i wouldn't recommend that because when you do that you're giving your back right okay um and because you never know if you can run into one of these uh so many people are seeing these that uh you know i i believe wholeheartedly that these things are out there vic how many dog men have been seen in one encounter if you know what i mean is uh is there an encounter where a a person or a group of people see eight of them or is it always alone or you know do these things travel in packs i guess like a, a wolf would well they have been reported in large numbers the largest number of dogmen i've been told about being seen at one time was six by a gentleman named abe sias who came on the show and told us about his experience where he had three of them on one side of him and three on the other in the middle of the night can in you the imagine the that vic i'd rather not that uh, would definitely be a bad moment I've, I've got goosebumps just thinking about that that's that's one is too many but oh, sure. six and and then i've also heard it mentioned on your show that you know there could have been more lurking in the shadows you know you, right. you just don't know there uh, could have been yeah they don't seem to travel in numbers like that all that often but then again yeah there could be situations where you see a dog man and there are five more in the bushes watching you that you don't even know about understand the wolves they travel in packs they hunt in packs because the game they take down are so large and formidable that normally one wolf has a hard time taking that game animal down you're talking about elk you're talking about bison moose with dog men, since they're so much bigger and so much more formidable, anything that they come across, all the way up to a bull or a horse, anything they come across, they should have no trouble dispatching all by themselves. So, in my opinion, that would make it a lot more likely that they would travel alone, a lot more often at least, than what, say, a wolf would do would be expected to do understand though too that case where abe sias reported seeing six that's not the only report where people have talked about seeing more than one there is a woman named shelly rockwell martin there was actually an episode of paranormal witness where she was featured her experience was featured on that episode of the show where five dog men flanked her and her husband on her front porch in maine one time so yeah it's not unprecedented it, it does happen but it doesn't seem to be all that often where something like that happens where people see a group of dog men yeah i actually believe i think i've i watched that episode 
Um, do these things leave physical traces behind? Do 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 they leave tracks? Uh, as silly as it sounds, has anybody seen dogmen scat? Is there physical evidence they're leaving behind? Has anybody made casts of a dogman print like they do Bigfoot? Yes, to all the above. Okay, so this is definitely um, in the physical. You know, these. Uh, I heard one of the stories where a man thought that the dogman ran through a fence. And, of course, I think he was on his way inside his house. And then he thought the next day that he would come outside and see the fence all messed up. But the fence was perfect. Um, so, for the most part, it doesn't seem like these things are supernatural. Therefore, what do you think? They've been around uh, maybe since, you know, before ancient times and, and just kind of like... We mostly think of Bigfoot. They've just been around uh, in the in the woods as as long, maybe even before humans. Is there any like ancient stories, or maybe yeah, I'm looking for something a little older than maybe Native American. Is there, you know, what's the oldest dogman story you've ever heard of? Or like the maybe the first record that comes out of these things? Well, when you look at the hieroglyphics that are found in Egypt of Anubis, that exactly. represents the dog man. So, yeah, I think they've been with us all the while. They might have even been here before we were. It's hard to say. My thoughts on Anubis, though, is uh, I don't believe he had like the canine legs and he was a god. So I don't know if these would... Uh... You know, I don't know how that ties into it, but I was wondering if there's any like ancient accounts. And when I was wondering that, Anubis definitely came to mind. Um, let's see. Uh, has there ever been a sighting where Bigfoot and Dogmen were seen in the same location? Oh, sure. Really? Yeah, there have been numerous reports like that. Uh huh. What happens there, I would imagine that if you're talking Dogman versus Bigfoot, I would imagine the Dogman could take the Bigfoot. It's They have weapons, you know what I mean? Uh, although the Bigfoot is probably a little bigger in mass, right? Uh, I would imagine these Dogmen... Uh, could probably take a Bigfoot. Has, that, has there been fights going down? There have been fights that have been reported, and the dogmen were reported coming out on top, but there's no way to verify that that's definitely what happened. But, yeah, there have been reports that have come in where they were supposedly fighting. There have been reports that have come in to report where they were seemingly standing side by side, and there wasn't any problem between them. I think since there have been so many more reports that have come in where they basically talk about the dogmen driving off the Sasquatch, I think that's probably a lot more likely to be the case, that they get along like oil and water. But not having seen any of these instances myself, I really don't know. But when people talk about the fact that Sasquatch are bigger than dogmen, I always bring this this idea to to the forefront i'm i'm over 200 pounds and i definitely even though i'm stronger than any rottweiler stronger than any king corso which might weigh 100 120 pounds 130 pounds i definitely would not want to be locked in a room with one that's maybe a 15 by 15 foot room in a fight to the death because even though that that Rottweiler, King Corso, Band Dog, even though I, I really I outweigh it tremendously, I still, because of its weaponry and other factors, I don't see how I could come out on top in a fight like that. That doesn't mean that there's no chance that a Sasquatch would be able to best a dog man. I really don't know, but when you look at the fact that dog men are still immensely strong, without even taking into the into consideration the fact that they have jaws, big powerful jaws and huge teeth that they can inflict all kinds of damage with and very formidable claws on their fingertips. 
that coupled with their strength against the Sasquatch's strength, that does give them a pretty good advantage in a lot of ways, in my opinion. And they're probably faster and more nimble than a Sasquatch would be, too. I don't know that, but that's just a guess. So if you look at all those factors, I think it'd be pretty hard to dismiss the Dogman having any chance in a fight like that, even if you're talking about a 600-pound Dogman fighting 1,000-pound Sasquatch. Right. Now, Sasquatch, they will do more, like, blunt force trauma right that's kind of their attack uh and so you're right i think a bigfoot may could take one but um you you do have several cases where the witnesses say that they were they knew bigfoot was living around their homes then they started seeing these dogmen and hearing them and then it seemed like Bigfoot went away, and there was more than one of those cases, right? So it does seem like that Bigfoot or the Sasquatch will move and, you know, let the uh, dogman have their territory. That's right, yeah. There have been numerous cases of that where Sasquatch were in an area, people knew they were there, the next thing you know, dogmen move in and the Sasquatch move out. So... If the Sasquatch are heading for the high country because dogmen moved in, what does that tell you? Right. Um, one of my favorite cases was episode 12. And I believe her name was Kat. Or Kate. And Kat. She, Kat. And she, uh, I really loved her story because uh, you really have to take in account of what the native indians say about these things right they've yeah a lot of these tribes have lived kind of with these you know they just to me they have a little bit more knowledge of these you know that their knowledge goes back you know no telling how many generations but her story was really riveting and i liked her insight what was your when you, I know it's hard to say this is my favorite case, but if you had to pick a case that was number one in uh, believability, uh, you know, maybe a really drastic one, um, you know, like maybe even the guy that got scratched, you know, he was actually hurt by one. What's your what's your what's the case that really stands out in your mind and can you just kind of describe the the case uh you don't have to go into detail or anything and then maybe you can even give the episode number if you remember Well I don't look at the episodes that way as far as having a favorite episode or anything like that I'm more focused on trying to deal with these problems that these poor eyewitnesses have but as far as popularity would go, I would say episode 117. Episode 117, episode 12, those two episodes seem to be one of the, the most popular couple of episodes that we've done. But there have been other episodes like episode 66 or 67 that have been very popular too. So it's hard to put a finger on one that I could actually call the best. But those episodes there, if someone only has time to check out three, four episodes, that's probably where I'd recommend starting. Of course, I mentioned episode 52, The Scars to Prove It. That's also one that I'd highly recommend checking out. But, yeah, you know, like I said, there are a lot of episodes that are were very well received. And if you're looking for nail-biting listening, those definitely would qualify. Another one of my favorites was, I don't have the episode in front of me, but it was a gentleman that was deer hunting on I think his uncle's property and I believe it might have been called something like don't turn around and he was hunting for deer or bow hunting he um, he got a deer it was turning dark he was sitting in his truck the deers in the back wrapped up I think he was writing out whatever kind of form you've got to write and one of these things jumps into the back of his of his pickup truck 
and he turns his like marine lights on that that is a really scary story that was one of my favorite ones um there's so many of them i definitely will check out 117 and 52 um i kind of started listening from the latest and then i went uh to the earliest so <laughs> it's like i'm i'll i'll finish it in the middle somewhere but um, you have so many great witnesses on your show, and you put an emphasis on helping the uh, witnesses. What kind of things can help somebody? Because a lot of these people have PTSD, right? From this? Oh, sure. And PTSD. A, yeah. Yeah. And almost uh, all of them have nightmares, right? A, a yeah, good... yeah. Most of them do have nightmares, unfortunately. But when you have an experience like that, it's pretty much expected. But yeah, in time, the nightmares normally do get better. But yeah, nightmares do seem to go hand in hand with having an experience with something like this. All right. Well, uh, I really appreciate you for being on, Vic, um, and. I just wanted to be another person to tell you that you're doing great work um, and these people need an outlet and it really does. I've, I've heard them thank you over and over just for letting them tell their story. Is that a big part of helping them if, if they just get this off their chest? Oh, that's how they get better is by talking about it. Yeah, that's what this whole thing is about, getting people to talk about things that are very uncomfortable for them to talk about. But I know that by getting them to talk about it, that's going to help the healing process tremendously. So, yeah, that's what this is all about. All right. Well, great. All right, Vic, I, I guess we'll end it here. And again, I appreciate you for coming on and uh, let's stay in contact. OK. That sounds good. Thanks again for having me on. All right. Thanks, Vic. Thanks.